Good morning. Buenos dias. Um, just something very quick that uh, from this morning, just being here uh, a little while, I want to first thank Kenny and, and uh, Nina, who I've just met today personally, face to face. Thank you so much uh, for and all of the leadership of your organization for the invitation uh, and reaching out to me. Second, I want to thank my sisters who were at the conversation cafe table with me this morning. My first real introduction uh, to Bioneers, and I thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, mostly just uh, the, the chance to talk about what we do have in common. Um, I want to read a few words about pesticides, and uh, before I go on, I also want to say and share with you one more thing. Um, uh, hearing the speakers this morning, which were really phenomenal, uh, this is kind of a different world. <laughs> I am, uh, I'm used to walking on stage and uh, chants and uh, clapping and uh, all sorts of things that happen in union halls, uh, you know, with teamsters and firefighters. And uh, this is quite different, but I want to th th tell you that I feel very great and honored to be here. <laughs> Let me read some words about pesticides and the environment from a speech delivered more than two and a half decades ago. The problem is this mammoth agribusiness system. The problem is the huge farms. The problem is the pressure on the land from developers. The problem is not allowing the land to lay fallow and rest. The problem is the abandonment of cultural practices that stood the test of centuries, crop rotation, diversification of crops. The problem is monoculture, growing acres and acres of the same crops, disrupting the natural order of things, letting insects feast on acres and acres of a harem of delight, and using pesticides that kill off their natural predators. We see these same insane practices reflected in the buyouts and the takeovers on Wall Street, exchanging long-term security for short-term gain. You sacrifice a company for the immediate rewards, but you destroy what produces jobs and livelihoods. Oscar Wilde once said, a cynic is someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. People forget that the soil is our sustenance. It is a sacred trust. It is what has worked for us for centuries. It is what we pass on to future generations. The man who said these words was not an environmental leader. He was one of the great labor leaders and one of the great Americans of the 20th century. He inspired me to get involved in the labor movement. But yes, he was also a great environmentalist. His name was Cesar Chavez. Many people don't realize that the first time DDT was banned in the United States was not by the EPA in 1972, but in a United Farm Workers contract with a grape grower in 1967. Cesar Chavez's Cesar last and longest public fast of 36 days in 1988 was to protest the pesticide poisoning of farm workers and their children. While he was alive, Cesar was harshly criticized by the powerful agricultural lobby and those Republican governors then for focusing his union's efforts and sacrificing his health over the perils of pesticides. Asked why, Cesar responded, because there is something even more important to farm workers than the benefits unionization brings, because there is something more important to the farm workers' union than winning better wages and working conditions. 
That is protecting farm workers and consumers from systematic poisoning through the reckless use of agricultural to toxics. There is nothing we care about mo than more about than the lives and the safety of our families. There is nothing we share more deeply in common with the consumers of North America than the safety of the food all of us rely on. Millions of Americans rallied behind La Causa, the farm workers' cause in the 60s and 70s. In fact, a survey was done, 17 million adults. It wasn't just because CESAD was battling on behalf of the poorest and the most abused workers in America. It was also because at the same time he was championing the environment and because he was struggling nonviolently. Today, there is great excitement about ecological produce and farming. There are growers who choose to farm organically and who may embrace ecological farming because they want to appeal to a profitable market niche. And they recognize the benefits of marketing pesticide-free products. But they treat their workers just as poorly as growers at ranches that employ pesticides. There is conventional wisdom amongst many consumers that because they purchase more pricey fruits and vegetables at co-ops or at high-end stores labeled organic, that the workers are also treated better. Brothers and sisters, this is not usually the case, and we must include both sides and all sides of the equation. Cesar Chavez taught me and so many others about building alliances between trade unionists, immigrants, and environmentalists long before such things became widely understood or accepted. One of Cesar's other disciples was my late husband, Miguel Contreras, who also got his start with the Farm Workers Union. When Miguel became leader of the Los Angeles labor movement in 1996, he worked tirelessly to build alliances and create partnerships that advanced the cause of workers' rights in Los Angeles. He did so by transcending the traditional boundaries of the labor movement. Miguel built alliances with faith-based activists during a long and bitter supermarket worker strike, working closely with religious activists and groups such as Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice. He rallied support from clergy and community organizations during a lockout of longshore workers. Miguel forged a similar alliance during the successful fight to stop the evil Walmart retail behemoth from opening a superstore in Inglewood, working closely with the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, a community-based nonprofit group. When mostly African-American bus drivers went on strike against the Metropolitan Transit Authority, Miguel rallied important support for the drivers. He mobilized all important pressure on public officials among LA's African-American churches. He reached out to solidify support and awareness about unions among students with a unique labor-sponsored initiative to pay for school books for mostly working class people enrolled in community colleges. Perhaps most important, Miguel turned the LA labor movement into an unqualified champion of immigrant workers. Remember, this was the mid-1990s. Immigrant workers had become the victims of cynical anti-immigrant wedge politics that was chiefly engineered by then Republican Governor Pete Wilson whose advisors and consultants now serve Governor Schwarzenegger. Before his da disastrous trouncing at the polls, Governor Schwarzenegger praised the Minutemen, anti-immigrant bigots who even President Bush labeled as vigilantes. Immigrants believed crass politicians such as Wilson made them into political scapegoats and there is plenty of evidence for that. First, K-12 
California Proposition 187, the successful 1994 initiative denying education and other basic benefits to undocumented immigrants and their children. Wilson used 187 to win re-election that year. Soon other politicians from across California and around the country discovered how easy it is to curry political favor among Anglo voters by attacking immigrants. Then Congress cut off benefits to legal immigrants in 1996. That year, California voters also backed Proposition 209, outlawing affirmative action to correct generations of discrimination. In 1998, there was approval of Proposition 227 to end bilingual education in California. By the way, I just took a trip to China with uh, Mayor Antonio Villarraigosa and uh, was very amazed to see that in the public education system over there, teaching English is very common and part of the curriculum. After years of immigrant bashing, Latino immigrants felt abandoned by government and most social and political institutions. The two exceptions in their eyes came to be the Catholic Church and organized labor. The labor movement across America has concentrated union organizing efforts on low wage industries where immig immigrants happen to be uh, a large part of the workforce. Until, his, until the passing of my husband in May of 2005, he had transformed the LA labor movement into a powerhouse of labor and political activism. He made Los Angeles the stage for the highest profile labor battles in America. LA Labor organized tens of thousands of immigrant workers suffering from poverty pay and lack of benefits and protections, home care workers, janitors, security officers, and finally, hotel and restaurant workers, whom my home union organized when I was privileged to lead the local. In all of these struggles, LA Labor has generated support by forming alliances with a wide, wide array of community, religious, minority, and student activists. Alliances and leadership on issues beyond labor's traditional but important workplace concerns. A diverse collection of unions have joined the Apollo Alliance, an exciting project working at the intersection of environmentalism and economic development. Nationally, the Apollo Alliance unites nearly 16 million union members and 11 million environmental organization members to promote job creation in environmental technology. In Southern California, union members as diverse as municipal workers, engineers, and laborers have come together to lay the foundation for an equitable and sustainable economy. One of our unions, uh, Local 18 of the uh, electrical workers, has pushed the city of Los Angeles towards a greener future. On another front, on another front, a new coalition of LA area environmental, labor, faith-based community, and public health organizations are working to promote sustainable trade and protect working families through the Coalition for Clean and Safe Ports. The current trucking system at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach is broken. Port trucking grossly pollutes the environment. It is chaotic, fragmented, and dominated by hundreds of tiny, undercapitalized motor carriers and brokers who undercut market standards. Drivers are overwhelmingly misclassified as independent contractors rather than employees. That allows trucking firms to disclaim responsibility for driver conditions and abuse. 90% of the truckers are immigrants. They make below $9 an hour, laboring more than 11 hours a day with little safety precautions and too many accidents. 95% have no retirement benefits and only 10% have health care coverage. They have no right to form a union. Our new coalition proposes a win-win solution mirrored on the model used at airports to provide food and service, food and other services to air travelers. A direct service contract between the ports and motor carriers. Under the contract, the ports would achieve clean, safe, and sustainable growth 
The drivers would see their lives and the lives of their families improved and protected, transforming an underground economy into a legitimate one. Miguel. Miguel also changed how unions deal with politics in Los Angeles. Instead of being what we call, what he called an ATM machine or a piggy bank for political candidates, candidates, that is, just giving money to their campaigns, he reached out to the rank and file. Immigrant workers, many of whom could not even register to vote themselves, now help elect public officials in key contests, from school boards to mayor of Los Angeles. Through mass political operations, thousands of labor activists, many immigrant workers, now operate phone banks and go door to door talking with other workers. Because of immigrant workers, men and women such as State Senator Gil Cedillo, U.S. Representative Hilda Solis, State Assembly Speaker Fabian Nunez, and Mayor Antonio Villarragosa serve our community in public office. But I want to say that Pete Wilson and a few other politicians did in a few, year, few years what activists in our own community failed to do in many decades. They motivated immigrants and other people to vote. <laughs> there is nothing that angers people more than what, when they believe they are being attacked simply because of who they are. Since the mid-90s, political participation by Latino voters has risen dramatically. In no small part because of that phenomenon, California has not been in play for Republicans in presidential elections since 1996. They have found it more difficult to prevail in many elections. But the ugly specter of immigrant bashing is still raising its head across this land anti-immigrant elected officials have stalled meaningful and comprehensive immigration reform in Congress. Last uh, December, uh, in the House of Representatives, the punitive Sensenbrenner bill uh, uh, called for deporting undocumented workers in this country now and criminalizing their presence. Taking a page from Pete Wilson, political candidates have once again embraced the cynical strategy of bashing immigrants. They've decided blaming immigrants for the nation's woes offers much great political rewards than have much greater political rewards than having to debate the war in Iraq. We know that immigrant bashers are everywhere. They're in the labor movement, they're in politicians, and we know that they're in the environmental movement. The Sierra Club held national referendums over whether to adopt policies that were anti-immigrant. To its credit, the club's leadership soundly rejected those proposals. We all, brothers and sisters, have the responsibility to teach, teach our members not to blame immigrants, rather embrace organize immigrants because immigrants have led progressive movements in this country generation after generation. <laughs> Immigrant bashers have something in common. Instead of calling hardworking, tax-paying people by their names, they call them names. Illegals, aliens, lawbreakers. These immigrants produce the great bounty of fresh fruits and vegetables over which we give thanks every day at our dinner tables. And we call them illegals. Into their care we entrust the most precious things that we have, the lives of our young children, and we call them aliens. Into their care, we entrust our parents and grandparents when they are too old and infirm and ridden with disease to care for themselves, and we call them lawbreakers. We tell them that they should be ashamed for having broken our laws for coming to this country to work, 
my fellow brothers and sisters, let us look into our own hearts and souls and ask ourselves who should be ashamed. When he was asked more than two decades ago about the future of political participation by Latinos in the state and country, Cesar Chavez replied that the influence Latinos didn't then enjoy at the ballot box would soon be made up in years to come. The Latino electorate is growing much faster than the non-Latino electorate. Between the 2000 vote and the election this November, the number of eligible Latino votes will have increased by about 20%, six times faster than the non-Hispanic population. The Hispanic population, uh, not to mention immigrants from many other parts of the world, is growing faster, in fact, in the South than anywhere else in the United States, from North Carolina to Arkansas, to Alabama and Tennessee. Some of you hopefully marched with millions just a few months ago. Um, they marched in cities like Los Angeles and New York, as well as Dallas and Atlanta for one simple thing, respect. Two weeks ago, the largest act of civil disobedience in the history of Los Angeles was led by hotel workers overwhelmingly Latino immigrants. In total, 300 activists supported by 2,000 supporters, housekeepers and dishwashers, clergy of all faiths, students from private and public universities, elected officials and union leaders, and environmental activists, all together saying enough is enough to global hotel owners and operators. An injury to one is an injury to all. None of us will stand by while poverty grows right under our nose. None of us will stand by anymore while corporations and governments put the needs of people below the profits of the rich. <clears throat> As the president of Unite Here International Union wrote recently, America was built by successive waves of immigrants, whether they came here voluntarily or involuntarily. The genius of this country has been its repeated ability to rejuvenate and re-energize itself with new immigrants, to fight against nativism and racism to enable all of them to become Americans and to stand eventually alongside earlier arrivals, all woven together into the great tapestry of America. Memories of who stands up for justice last a long time. Catholics voted overwhelmingly Democratic for generations, stemming from nativist, Republican, anti-immigrant positions in the first part of the 20th century. Brothers and sisters, these are human rights issues. The fact that the political future is also at stake should be a bonus. So let us continue striving to seek common ground and forge alliances at every opportunity between labor, the environmental, and immigrant communities. Not just because it is the smart thing to do, but because it is the right thing to do. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Que viva Cesar Chavez. Que viva la Unión. Que viva el movimiento. Si se puede.